Good morning and welcome to Lake County Tribal Health Legacy Garden. Uh, we're here with uh, Master Gardener Gabrielle O'Neill again. Wonderful. And we're going to be talking about what can be grown in Lake County and when with a special emphasis on container gardening. So thank you for joining us and enjoy. All right. Well, <clears throat> The reason why we, we did the container gar we added the container gardening thing was it was supposed to be an extra class and then I realized that what can be grown when is a class that actually doesn't take up the entire space for the beginner level crowd. <laughs> for the advanced level crowd that could take more hours than we have here. But what you probably are interested in can be covered in a fairly short time. And so we can devote a little time to container gardening. Now, what can be, be grown when in Lake County is a much more important topic than most people realize. Because I have learned to garden in Germany, you know, 40 some years ago. <laughs> and then I moved to Los Angeles and I gardened there. And then for a while I was up in Bishop Eastern Sierra. Then I moved here to Lake County. and. Of all the environments I've gardened, I found Lake County by far to be the most challenging environment to garden. I have a, an official journeyman landscaper gardener certificate from Germany, and that did me absolutely no good there, because most things I learned were just not applicable, you know, because the climate is different, the soil is different, the seasons are different. There's a lot of factors here that are totally different. And uh, the problem is uh, that when people get into gardening first, a lot of people start out by picking up a gardening book. You know, some cute looking book that they yeah. see online on Amazon or in the bookstore. And it turns out that it, it's getting better now, but until a few years ago, literally 95% of all the gardening books were written by people that live in a climate and in an environment that is fundamentally different from the so what they talk about in their books and the methods they espouse simply don't work here. And a big part of it is, is that the plants we tend to grow in our vegetable gardens, for the most part, are plants that have originated in Europe or Asia. We say Eurasia, you know, mm -hmm. to make it simpler. They originated somewhere in Asia, but have been grown in Europe for centuries. And they, are, they have been adapted and have evolved in that climate and in that environment. There is no vegetable that I'm aware of that is commonly grown in vegetable gardens nowadays that has evolved in a climate similar to that of Lake County. That does not exist. And you, Darlene, mm. probably know. People here didn't eat vegetables. They ate acorns, they ate uh, fish. Yeah. They ate the things that grew here, you know, because yeah. tender vegetables, zucchini, don't grow naturally in Lake County. They don't like it here. Yeah. You know, the climate is not conducive. So, but because we have been conditioned to like things that have originated in Europe and Asia, the people who have taken it upon themselves to grow them in their own garden have realized that it takes a lot of coaxing and babying and, you know, treating to get these plants to survive here. It's not easy. So growing a vegetable garden here, and I started out not as a beginner, I started out as a journeyman gardener with a master gardener training on top of it. And it still took me five years of trial and error to figure out exactly what works in Lake County and what doesn't. So don't feel disheartened yeah. when after a two hour class, you think you yeah. don't know everything about it. It took me a long time to learn that. And the reason I joined the UC Master Gardener program in Lake County was number one, because I wanted to talk to local people and find out what, what actually works here. And number two, I wanted to save other people the disappointing experiences that I had already been through, trying things that didn't work and share what I found actually does work. And one of the biggest things I learned that timing in Lake County is more important than anything and more difficult than anywhere else because we don't have these totally predictable seasons like, you know, my brother lives in South Dakota, just as an example. It's flat, the climate is the same in the whole state, you know exactly what the weather is going to be in any given month pretty much. And even though the climate is worse than here in general, at least it's pretty predictable. You know exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and you can prepare for it. 
So I went into many nurseries when I visited him and there was about 15 plants that you can buy in every nursery that they have found out through trial and error are bulletproof and work for everybody. And then I took a walk through all the gardens in the neighborhood and everybody has those 15 plants because they work. So luckily we are not that limited. We have a much wider range of temperatures and conditions here. But the tricky thing about it then is also that you don't have that one, two, three, four step system that's yeah. bulletproof. You have to pay more attention. You have to get the timing down better, right? So <clears throat> the first thing that I already mentioned a little bit before we started uh, filming was that most of these vegetables that we like to eat, yeah. you know, have not evolved in an area like Lake County. They come from Eurasia, even, you know, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, mm -hmm. some from Southern Europe or from Asia. And they have totally evolved in totally different climatic conditions. So just like with every plant, a gardener always tries to mimic the natural environment that these plants used to grow as best as possible. And with vegetables, that's almost impossible because vegetables in their current modern form did not really exist anywhere in nature, right? What we know as lettuce, for instance, evolved as a little thing that looks more like a sow thistle. You know what a sow thistle looks like? It's that spiny little soft weed that has a yellow flower and oh, maybe yeah. five, six edible leaves on it, not very tender, a milky juice, just like the lettuce, right? So this is the kind of plant from which lettuce was bred by the people early on over the centuries. So in the form that we grow it now, it does not exist anywhere. It's a complete freak of nature and it can only survive with lots of human input. And when you look at a plant like lettuce, you can already see it's a super tender plant, right? I mean, it looks like anything could hurt it and, it, and anything does. So <clears throat> the only time a plant like that can make it in this environment is the cool season, obviously. It has not evolved for triple digit temperatures. And even though there are some lettuce cultivars that have been bred in the desert in Israel that can survive triple digit temperatures, uh, and I've grown them in my garden, they do actually, they are very hardy, but they don't give you the typical lettuce taste that I crave, you know. They become a different plant in order to survive the temperature. And, and the taste of the leaves is more, than, more like cardboard than, let, than the buttery soft taste that we all like about lettuce. So I don't try to grow lettuce in June, July, August, September, because it's just not worth the trouble. You would have to put up a, a complicated shade structure with a misting system. And there's commercial growing facilities that do that. Yeah. And for them it's worth doing it because they do it on a large scale. But for the home gardeners to go through such incredible amount of work to make a vegetable happy, it's just not worth it. Economically it's not worth it. You know, who has the money to buy all this stuff? And your work and your time. So I, and master gardeners in general, we recommend growing the plants at a time when it's easiest. And that's why I brought this uh, handout is called Timing in the Lake County Vegetable Garden. And then we have the vegetable planting schedule of Lake County that's alphabetically organized. And it pretty much tells you when a vegetable can be started, when it can be started by seed, when it's being transplanted, uh, when it's likely to work. You see, you see kind of gray, uh, black and white striped areas, and then you see black areas. Yeah. The way that works is the, the black and white striped area means it might work. The black means it's very for sure going to work, 95%, right? So to give you an example here, pick any vegetable. Uh, let's say spinach. That would be on, on the second page. Um, or it's down here. Spinach, here. So it will say the seeds are started in or outdoors, okay, works for sure in February, works for sure in March, and then it works for sure again in September. See how that works when you move over to the right? Or let's take a vegetable such as winter squash. Is a little below spinach, yeah. right? 
To the left of the vegetable, you also see a W or a C. That tells you right away, when you see a W, it means it's a warm season vegetable, meaning we grow that during the summer. When you see a C, it means it's a cool season vegetable, which cool season vegetables can either be started in the late summer to come to fruition in the fall, or they can be started with some help, such as a cold frame or a loop tunnel, very early in the season. So they give us some edible before it gets really hot. You know, they usually are harvested before mid-June or end of June before it gets really hot. So we have two cool seasons, really, or two starting periods for cool season, but only one starting period for the warm season. So do you understand how that schedule works, that Lake County planning schedule? When you see the black and white stripe, that means that might work depending on what kind of year we have. Because as, as you look at this year, right, you yeah. probably all agree with me, this was a completely untypical year for Lake County. I mean, at least in my garden, I had the longest, coolest spring in over 10 years in my garden. Totally untypical. Typical would be that by beginning of mid-May that we already have triple digits where I live. That's the normal thing for Lake County. Well, this year, it's still relatively bearable and we're like almost mid-June, so totally untypical. That's why we have these black and white striped areas, because that means, depending on what kind of year it have, we have, like to give an example, um, you know, with, with melons, melons under February, it says, oh, sorry, that's the lettuce, excuse me, lettuce under February, it says direct seeding might work or might not work. It totally depends on what kind of year we have, right? This year in Lake County, January and February in my garden was warmer than March. Both January and February were warmer than the second half of March. Unt totally untypical. We always, every year, because I keep a garden diary, which I highly recommend to everybody. That's how you learn best from your experiences. And my garden diary says that almost every single year we have a period of very warm weather in January or February that typically lasts about two, three weeks. That's the normal. It, it either happens in late January or early February. There's a really warm period where it feels like spring is here and people who come new to the county plant all their summer vegetables because they think this is it, this is spring, I'm gonna put everything in. And then generally in a norm, quote unquote normal year, in March we get a heavy frost again and all the stuff that you put in in February freezes, right? So this is the normal thing. But this year, almost all of January and February were very unseasonally warm. And then March, I did not get a hard frost in March. I, depending on where you live, you might have gotten or not, you know. So there's years when you actually can get away with things like that. But you never know ahead of time. Because this place is not one of those predictable places where everything happens the same every year. And that's why we have these areas, you know, the gray area might or might not work. Try your luck. So, would you suggest, I know a lot of people, they like, they buy stuff from um, um, nurseries and stuff that have already been brought to a certain stage right. to help them with the, you know, the short times right, that we exactly. have. So, would you recommend that? Well, that totally depends. If you have a cold frame, for instance, do you know what a cold frame is? It's basically a lid on your bed. It's, it's another wooden box on your bed with a lid made out of plastic or plexiglass or real glass, which makes like a little mini greenhouse out of your bed. If you have something like that, you can take the chance and, you know, and buy that starter. Still, um, nurseries often sell that stuff as early as February, right? Especially new nurseries. Um, to tell you a funny story, even though it has nothing, uh, it actually has something to do with it. Uh, this was probably 10 years ago. I went to the farmer's market in, in Kelseyville and there was a brand new nursery run by a young woman. She was in her early 20s, right? Um, and she was, and this was fall. We're talking September, October. Uh, I was there as a master gardener, so I already browsed the booths around and I went to this nursery and she had little melon seedlings for sale in September, October. So I said to her, why are you selling these? This, those are summer vegetables, you know. They are not grown here in September. She said, no, this is a winter melon. It says right there on the label. She obviously got that from a wholesale nursery that, you know, grew it 
for probably areas like San Diego or uh, who knows where she had it from. Some wholesale nurseries that grow for greenhouse growers. So she always says right here, it's a winter melon. I said, well, you know, we, we grow winter squash, but you started in May. It's called winter squash because it lasts all winter long, not because you <laughs> grow it in winter, right? She did not believe me, okay? She said, this is a very special melon. I was told this grows in winter. I said, you know what? I am 99% sure you're wrong, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy one from you and grow it and see how long it lasts, right? So, of course, it didn't last. What I'm saying is, if you want to be successful, stick to the schedule. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot buy a transplant-ready seedling in a nursery. If I don't have time, when there's a year where I'm out of the country or whatever, and I don't have time to raise my own seedlings, that happens occasionally, then I will buy seedlings too. But I'm not going to buy a seedling any earlier than would be the time to transplant, the right time to transplant it in my area. So where I live is kind of a hot pocket of LA and generally in a normal year the last average frost date for me is mid-April. So I know starting mid-April it's usually safe to put my tomatoes and peppers in, usually. Of course there's an exception every 10 years, right? But that's usually safe. So this would be a time where I could go to a nursery and, and, fly, and buy a transplant ready seedling and put it. However, even there is a caveat. A seedling that has been that is sold in a nursery usually has been raised in a greenhouse under optimal conditions. So when you put the seedling that comes fresh from a greenhouse where there's optimal humidity, optimal temperature, no wind, and you put that outside in Lake County and we have the kind of windy days that we had this spring, that seedling isn't gonna survive even in mid-April. Do you know what I'm saying? Whereas a seedling that you raised yourself from seed that you have slowly taken out for a few hours and a few hours more the next week, that you have slowly gotten used to the growing conditions in your garden, is going to be doing much, much better than something that you bought in a nursery that has been raised under ideal conditions and then is thrown out to hell in Lake County, basically, you know? So keep that in mind. When you buy your seedlings ready to go, they are usually tampered in a greenhouse, so do not put them out any earlier than necessary unless you don't mind wasting money right so what I do when I raise my own seedlings from from seed which I do most of the time I always raise much more than I need as you know because I bring all the surplus here for you to give away but I always raise at least five times as much as I need uh, because then I can experiment with it then then I don't have to pay five dollars for every seedling at the nursery and if it dies I've lost five dollars. I have lost a couple of cents on the seedling if I don't count my work time, you know. So if my first batch that I put out in mid-April dies, no big deal. I have 20 more in my little either seed starting greenhouse or on a board on my bathtub in the house that I can replace those with. So if you raise your own from seed, I always recommend raising more than you need so you can be adventurous and put them out at a time when it might or might not work because a lot of times it does work and if it doesn't work you have another one in the house waiting that you can put out if it doesn't work right so that's why different people like different ways of learning so that's why i also made this it's a little bit more like a novel you can read it like a novel it's called timing in the vegetable garden so this is for the engineers and this is for the novel readers so here it goes like this it's it's divvied up by months, kind of like an almanac. We call it an almanac format. So we have January, and it tells you some of the things that we do in January. Because we have such mild winters in Lake County, most people don't realize you can actually grow things year round. In this garden, for now, we only grow things starting in May, end of May, you know, for the, for the warm season. But actually, there's things you can plant almost every month out of the year except for December. You and it'll survive. So when you look at this, this will give you a little bit of an idea. Like in January, which is still the cool season, you can already start some kale, some cabbage, any of the coal crops can be started in January and they will make it to eating stage before it gets really hot if you choose a short season variety. Do you know what a short season variety yeah. of vegetable is, Darlene? No. no? When you look at the seed catalog, 
you know, you see pictures and uh -huh. names of all these different yeah. cultivars. Let's say they sell five different kinds of cabbages, right? Yeah. The first cabbage will say January King, 110 days. And the second cabbage will say Alaska's finest, 150 days. And the third cabbage will say California special, 75 days. Which would you buy? California? Well, in this well, case, it's nice. easy because yeah. it says California <laughs> special. Yeah. But if it didn't say California special, what would tip you off to that one? Let's say it was called uh, Ruby Pride. <laughs> okay. 75 days. Okay. The 75 yeah. days. Yeah. It shows you that this vegetable makes it from seed to eating stage in 75 days. This is what, okay. what that number means. Oh, okay. Whereas the other cabbage that says 110 mm -hmm. days or 150 yeah. days, it'll take 110 or 150 days to make it from seed to eating stage. And because we have such erratic seasons, you're always better off in Lake County taking short season varieties of any vegetable, even in the summer season, you know? Because the shorter it takes to make it to eating stage, the less chances of having a catastrophic weather event that's gonna wipe it out. That's the bottom line. In mild climates, such as on the California coast, where it's pretty much almost 50, 60, 65 degrees year round, you can grow that Alaska fried cabbage because it's gonna be between 50 and 65 degrees for months on end, which is the ideal temperature for cabbages. Well, in Lake County, those vegetables that have evolved in Northern Europe or Asia, like, you know, cabbages, lettuce, all that stuff that likes it kind of cool and crisp, there is only very short periods of time in Lake County where we can reliably count on that kind of weather. So using a short season variety is going to give you a much better chance at success. And starting early. Starting early. So in January, I already start the seeds mm -hmm. for that kind of cabbage. And then I start them again, believe it or not, in August or beginning of September to have a, a fresh crop that overwinters. Because oh. cabbage and kale, they can take a light frost. They will be fine all winter long. If you expect a heavy frost, all you have to do is that night watching the weather report, you throw a blanket over it. And chances are that you're only gonna have one or two nights where that happens, and the rest of the time is gonna be perfect temperatures for your cabbage, you know? So that is when you, you know, do crops that on our on our planting yeah. schedule have a C in front, meaning cool season vegetables. Yeah. Either the cool season starting in January till mid-June, or starting in late summer, and then over the winter. So you can see, um, in January, I'm starting some of these cool season vegetables, and then I keep harvesting the winter lettuce and the kale that I started in, in uh, not in December, in September. Yeah. Yeah. I start a lot of lettuce in September, and some of it is still producing. The one that you keep harvesting from the outside in, uh -huh. you know, is often still producing in January, and you can still harvest that. I still harvest the kale that I sowed the, the um, September before. I harvest the marjoram that is a perennial that grows year round in my garden. And whenever we have a, a little warm spell during the winter, that will put on a couple inches of growth that can be harvested. So then in mid-February, we already we already have to plan for our warm season garden if we do grow, grow our own uh, warm season vegetable from seed. Because there is one or two kind of vegetables especially that take a long, long time from seed to transplant ready. And that's peppers and eggplants. Mm -hmm. They take forever till you see anything substantial. Mm -hmm. So they need to be started no later than mid-February from seed in order to be ready to transplant by May. So the ones I started in mid-February from seed are still, were still only that big end of May because we had such a cool spring. They were only like four or five inches tall. Oh. They had been growing since mid-February. Wow. Yeah. So this is why you have to consult these schedules. You know, when people think warm season garden, oh, I'm gonna go, go grow my own stuff from seed. And when it's May and it gets warm, they think of growing peppers and they put a pepper seed in the ground in May. Well, guess yeah. how long that takes to yeah, make a takes, pepper. Yeah. You're not gonna see any peppers till December from now, <laughs> you know? I have actually experimented. Of course, during that time, that pepper seed grows much faster than starting it in February in your greenhouse or bathroom or wherever you started. So it will go faster, but still, I found that the latest I can put a pepper seed in the ground 
and still expect a fruit out of it before the first frost in my area is June. I can actually still put a pepper seed in the ground where I am in June and by November I usually get a pepper out of it just before the first frost hits. <laughs> but I don't usually do that. I don't wait till June, right? Unless something crazy happened and all my early peppers got wiped out. I just figured out that this is how late I can start it and I will still be able to get a fruit out of it that year. But it's not desirable to start that late, right? So when you go along, you know, that schedule, you kind of get an idea. And I did not put everything that's yeah. being done in that month in there. Obviously, otherwise it would have been 10 pages long. I just wanted to give you a little selection so you get an idea that there's something important happening every month of the year. Pretty much, as a rule of thumb, all the vegetables that are technically fruits are grown in summer. You know, all these summer vegetables are actually botanically speaking fruits. Tomatoes, a tomato is a fruit, even yeah. though we eat it as a vegetable. A cucumber is a fruit. A zucchini is a fruit. An eggplant is a fruit. All these Taking summer with vegetables. Seeds is a fruit, right? Exactly. So all these I remember fleshy, that from last time. Exactly. These fleshy things that have <laughs> seeds are technically all fruits. And those things are all grown in summer, in the warm season in Lake County. Whereas the, the vegetables where we like to eat the leaves are generally grown in the cool season. There is exceptions. Pretty much all the vegetables that originated in South America are summer vegetables. Potato is, a, is an exception because even the potatoes also, also originated in South America. They were grown in very high elevations and where it was much cooler. So we can get away growing potatoes during the cool season. Everything that comes from Northern Europe is a cool season vegetable because Lake, Crown, Lake County has such dramatic up and down temperature swings. And some years are completely different than other years. There's exceptions to every year rule. And sometimes you can get away with things that I would not recommend to anybody. I want to give you a funny example. Uh, two years ago, I went through all my seeds to kind of throw out the old stuff and, you know, sort them at the beginning of the season and I realized that I had bags full of squash seeds you know because every year I save so many squash seeds and I had bags full of squash seeds that were 10 years old or older how do you know when they're not good anymore there's actually tables that you can look up online that will tell you how long they last on average but it depends totally on what temperature you store them at and how much the temperature was fluctuating during storage so first of all all my really valuable seeds I store in the fridge but you know, when you have bags full of squash seeds, I don't have that much space in the fridge. So I store those in my pantry. So I thought, well, instead of throwing them away, I have an empty bed that I need a cover crop for. I'm gonna throw two bags full of squash seeds in that empty bed and then break them in. And I know probably 5% of them will still be good and they'll eventually sprout and they'll make a good cover crop that I can turn under before I plant my summer crop, right? Well, guess what? It was one of those crazy years in my garden almost every one of those seeds sprouted and not only that this was in february i sowed them in february mid-february none of them froze we had no frost zero frost that year so none of them froze so i had probably a thousand squashes coming up in that one big this was a four by 20 foot bed right so i had like a, a thousand squashes coming up i had no idea what was what because i just threw all those seeds in there so I thought, what am I going to do now? I didn't have the heart to turn them under now because by May they were looking fantastic. Oh, what I should mention is I thinned them out because it was way too many. And by May they looked so good that I thought, well, I would be crazy to start my squashes from seed now when I already have like, you know, two foot high fantastic yeah. looking squashes growing there. Even though I don't know what I let them grow. And I want to say by mid-July I harvested all my winter squashes. It just tells you that this place is so unpredictable that you never know what you're going to get away with, but just don't count on it. And of course, I keep a diary and write those things down, so I know things like that can happen. You can actually get away sowing squash in February, but doesn't mean I would know how to do that, right? This is about the timing. Now I want to get a little bit into container gardening, because one of the peculiarities of Lake County is also that in many areas of Lake County, for instance, the area where I live, the soil is so bad, you can't even grow beans in it. Really. I learned early on that it takes a long time to amend the kind of soil I have to make it really useful for growing vegetables. So I basically built raised beds about that high. And 
bought a whole bunch of wine barrels and used half wine barrels um, and bought perfect soil from a place in Sonoma County. You know, I just did an investment because I figured I'm starting out with perfect soil. This is going to last me forever, right? And then I planted in there. So basically what I did is container growing. Mm -hmm. So a raised bed like you have here is really a big container. Now I would make them out of cinder block if I did it again, because cinder block also lasts a lifetime, it's cheaper, and you can take them apart and put them together differently and you can move them much easier. There's many ways to grow vegetables in much, much smaller containers. Realistically, I do not grow vegetables in anything smaller than that. Okay. This is the smallest container I would grow vegetables in. Uh, the, actually, most of the small containers I use are half wine barrels, which is kind of an ideal size, you know, for a vegetable container garden. And the reason why is, you know, when I first when I first moved here, I bought things like that, coming from Los Angeles, from the west side, where it's always a sea breeze, the temperature is always 75 degrees. The soil was perfect. There is no critters that eat your vegetables. There's not even any flies, you know? I mean, growing conditions are so ideal, it's almost ridiculous, right? So I bought these kind of things and thought, that's so cute, I'm gonna hang that on my doors and I'm gonna grow like, you know, um, sweet potatoes in or whatever, <laughs> you know, hanging things, right? And I realized that that thing in the summer in triple digits in Lake County dries out in one hour. You have to water that about five times a day to oh, just wow. keep it alive, right? So I, I immediately realized that this is not the way to go. To, and, and then I tried to grow succulents in it. <laughs> I thought, well, obviously vegetables don't work. Then I grow even succulents. I had to water literally twice, twice a day in there because mm -hmm. it becomes like, you know, as dry as sawdust in one day. So I do not recommend that. Uh, Good to know. Same as with clay containers. Unless you're in an area that's in the shade, there's actually places on Cobb, or at least were, that are in the shade all the time where you could probably get away with a clay container. Of course, not that size, right? <laughs> but a big clay container, that might work in a shady spot. There's pots that have these, these yeah. uh, things that come with it, the saucers that catch the overflow of the water, which is a good idea, but it doesn't catch enough extra water to really supply your plant with enough water on a hot day. Wooden, wooden uh, wood is a viable option for cooking. I actually lined it with plastic and I grew succulents in it. And despite the fact that I lined it with plastic, did not even poke holes in the plastic, water managed to seep through. And in the short time, I've only used this for a month or two. In that short time I used this, you can see what happened here. The wood got wet. And immediately the, the nails dislodged and the whole thing was like wow. coming apart. If you use wood, number one, you do have to line it with something that you know protects it from rotting, unless you use cedar or redwood. Cedar or redwood are the only things where you can put dirt directly in it. Do not use nails, use screws. Nails will come out in the Then there is the ever popular grow bags. Everybody in Lake County knows what a grow bag is, right? <laughs> Well, the good thing about grow bags is they're cheap, you know, they're available in every size. This is a strawberry planter and I fell for that because it was just cute, you know, and I needed a strawberry. I had had a, I had an earthen one that I broke accidentally and I didn't want to shell out the money for a, for a new ceramic one. So I thought, oh, this is much cheaper. Let's try that. Well, again, guess how many times I had to water my strawberries every day to keep them alive in there, right? It's not that it's not doable. If you put that on an irrigation system and you just set it to come on twice a day, why not? Or the other thing I found that works is if you put it in a place where the actual container is in the shade, but the plants are in the sun, then it dries out a lot less. I put that behind an old bathtub where the, the, the bag itself was actually in the shade and the plants were in the sun and then it lasted the whole day. One of our master gardeners grew his entire vegetables in a, in a bag, in a grow bag garden, but he had it set up in rows with an irrigation system where twice a day the irrigation came on and was, you know, you have a little uh, quarter inch black line with inbuilt emitters that you can curl inside that thing and it gets water twice a day. Now, the thing to remember when you have an irrigation system in Lake County is 
if that irrigation system has water in it and it comes on in the middle of the day on a triple digit day oh, yeah. it, it'll pour boiling water yeah. on your roots and it'll kill your plants with yeah. boiling water so you have to set the irrigation system that it comes on either early in the morning or after the sun is down you cannot let it come on in the middle yeah. of the day as much as you want to you know does not work one thing i found helpful if you have a patio and you have containers that are too heavy to move there's these nifty little things with rollers on there they come in all sizes by the way a fruit tree you have to have a minimum of a half wine barrel size to grow a fruit tree you can't really grow it in any smaller container than that but you can do that um, lime trees lemon trees can be grown in half wine barrels but then the, the question is, how do you move that thing once it's full of water? You need to have it on something like that, otherwise it will be impossible to move. So these are helpful, and they come in all sizes. Who grows things in containers here? Okay. Successful? I have, I have big plants in containers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big plants in containers. As you see, a lot of things can be grown in the hanging <coughs> planters uh, if there's enough root space, but again, you know, how big is it, right? I'm at now I don't have a lot of outside space. Space, yeah. So, uh, and it made me think, you know, hmm, I wonder if I can put stuff inside. I haven't tried. Now, if, it's, if it's the size of this, for instance, is it the size of that container? If it's smaller than that, forget about growing vegetables in it, is what I'm trying to say. Well, like you herbs, know. probably. Herbs, you can grow. Um, and some herbs are fairly drought tolerant, such as thyme. You know, all the Mediterranean herbs are fairly drought tolerant and you could grow them in something like that. Even so, the only reason this thing, you can see that the soil is practically open. It's not closed. So this is evaporating water constantly at a very fast rate. I would not recommend growing any vegetable in a container that evaporates water like that. It's not a good, this is meant for coastal climates. These, these types of containers, they are meant for tropical climates and coastal climates. In tropical climates, this works great because, because it, it evaporates water so things don't rot. If you're in a desert type of climate or something like Lake County, you want the opposite. You want to keep all the water in that you can. You, know? you can grow fantastic stuff in an old bathtub. And some of those sometimes are easy to come by. People throw them out. And you can turn that into a fantastic race. Basically what I'm saying is get the biggest container you can afford and have space for. Much more likely to be successful. The smaller the container is for fruit gardening, the faster the thing dries out. And it's not just about drying out. The root space heats up more in a small container. These roots, in a big container such as a barrel, you'll see when it gets really hot on the outside, the roots don't grow all the way to the outside. They stay in the middle of the container where it's not 150 degrees. If you have a container that's only a foot wide, there is no space for those roots to get away from the heat. In a little container, it'll be 150 degrees in the whole container in the root space. So it doesn't work unless you manage to keep the bottom in the shade somehow. What's important is drainage, besides having the biggest, it has to have drainage, absolutely, right? So if you take one of those plastic tabs, you can see how many yeah, holes no. this has, right? So if you, if you pick one of those plastic tabs, drill holes in it, and it would be ideal to get it a little bit off the ground, because if you have it right on the ground, those holes are gonna plug up really fast. You know, if you get it a little bit off the ground, that kind of ensures that the holes don't plug up. Yeah, I, was gonna say, I see some people, they, um, they'll put, um, like they get a, um, like one of those trays, but they have wheels on it, but they'll oh, put yeah. rocks on it. Then they'll put their container on the rocks. On the rocks. Yeah, it's a good so, idea. So when, uh, make the they drain. Say when the water goes down, right. they'll, they have mm -hmm. good bend. It looks, yeah. I don't know. I love this. That's, that's I a good way to on. ensure uh -huh. drainage, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there's one more thing I want to add, also from my own learning it the hard way experience. Uh, when I first started gardening in wine barrels, um, things were going really great in the first year. Then in the second year, I noticed that no matter how much water I put into some of those barrels, the plants were wilting after an hour, even if I poured five gallons in there several times a day. And at the end of the season, when I took everything out, I realized that the oak roots of the oak trees growing around had grown into the drainage oh. holes of the barrels from oh. the bottom up. 
had circled the whole barrel. So pretty much three quarters of that barrel was full of oak wood. Oh, so wow. that's when I realized that any, any large tree in your area that has an invasive brooding habit, which oaks have obviously, but other trees have that too, mulberry trees, you know, like the fruitless mulberry that's common everywhere has the same habit. A lot of trees do that, oleanders do that. They will invade your containers from the bottom and, and grow in there. Mm -hmm. So what I realized, I have to move my barrels to a slightly different spot every year to keep that from happening. Or another thing I started doing, I put bricks under the barrels so mm -hmm. that the barrel is not directly resting on the ground. So then I have an air gap and the roots will not grow through. <laughs> Drainage is important and staying away from tree roots is important. Containers can be made out of anything really. But the one thing you have to keep in mind is that it's food safe. You don't want to grow food plants in a container where you have the feeling it's leaching off toxic chemicals. Yeah. So some plastics are not considered food safe. Anything that's a flower pot is usually food safe because you know, vegetable starts are sold in things like that. Anything that's a hard plastic like that is usually food safe. But there's some metals that are not food safe, like aluminum reacts mm -hmm. when the when the either the growing medium or the water is acidic, it will react and it will leach uh, you know metals out of the aluminum. So I would not use aluminum for food. Terracotta containers they perspire too much, they lose too much water in general. Now we have glazed clay containers where the outside is glazed, they um, transpire a lot less and they will work. Now with the glaze, again, you want to make sure it's a food safe glaze. And it's not always possible to find that out when you buy a terracotta container if this is a food safe glaze. Anything that's usually made in America, you can assume it's probably safe, but uh, if it's imported, you have no idea how this, how this was manufactured. Yeah. So. I kind of shy away from, from using that for food. But you can make your own um, concrete containers in any shape if you have the molds, once you have the molds. Hypertufa is something I love because it's not as heavy. However, they're very expensive. Big Hypertufa containers are expensive, so not usually an option for most people for vegetable gardening. Polyurethane foam, again, you know, nice looking stuff. How do you prepare your container for planting? What would you do if you wanted to plant, let's say, a tomato plant in there? What would you do first? Would you put your potting soil in first? Yeah. So I always put my barrels exactly where I want them before I fill oh, them. Okay. Because <laughs> once it's full, you can. I tried to transport full barrels with a hand truck and uh, it's not a good idea. So I'll put a sheet of newspaper in it and then I put my soil in there. Now with soil. Uh, so if you use a purchased growing medium, the roots are going to have a much easier time making their way around in there. It's going to hold more air, it's going to hold more water. It's lighter, you know, than your natural clay soil. And you can also add all the goodies that you want in there. Now you can mix your own growing medium. And there's, we have recipes at the Master Gardens office if you mix it yourself. And there's a lot of recipes online at the Rodale website, at some of the other gardening websites we use. But I find it easier usually to just purchase a good growing medium and then I can add some of my favorite things if I want. Uh, one of the things, if it already has perlite or vermiculite, you don't have to add anything for making it more airy. What I usually add before I plant is a good organic all-purpose fertilizer. There's a lot of considerations that go into what you are actually going to use. To give you an example, I have cats that roam my a garden that I need to keep the ground squirrels in check that otherwise eat all my vegetables but my cats are attracted to fish smell okay so a lot of the fertilizers that contain fish byproducts I will end up having my cats digging up the stuff in there to get to the what they think is the buried fish in there right when I still had dogs I don't have dogs anymore but when I still had dogs any organic fertilizer that had blood meal and bone meal in it, the dogs would end up digging in there because they were trying to get to the blood. They, you know, they smelled the blood and the bones. So I could not use anything with blood or bone meal in, a, in any container that was accessible to the dogs. I mix most of the fertilizer in the upper six inches because as you water, it will go further down by itself. If you put it too far down, it's not going to come up once it's down there. But if it's up there, it will go down just through the watering pool. So you should mix it in the upper six inches, no further down. And that fertilizer that you put in before you plant 
Uh, it's gonna last your vegetables usually a maximum of six weeks. Keep that in mind. When we, when we had the fertilizer class, we talked about that. So if you plant tomatoes or peppers or anything where you harvest a lot, after six weeks, you have to add more fertilizer to your container because otherwise that plant is gonna run out of nutrients. And the way you add more fertilizer, sometimes it's very hard to kind of add more granular. For, if you have used, you know, the, the powdered organic fertilizer and your plant has grown so big that it has, that it's already hanging over the container, it will be impossible to incorporate more granular fertilizer at this time. Then what I would do is, use liquid fertilizer and I use the liquid fertilizer once or twice a week mixed with water. Now this, just as an example, this is called fish from native nutrients. I'm sorry, this is a very old dirty bottle, but uh, that just happened, happened when I grabbed when I left home. And you can see here, um, unlike most fish fertilizers that are mostly nitrogen, this has the numbers 2, 4, 0 0.2. That means 2% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, and 0.2 potassium, right? Most fish fertilizers are heavy on the nitrogen, the first, which is the first number. Any fertilizer that's heavy on the nitrogen is gonna promote mostly leafy growth, green leafy growth. So in the summer, when we grow vegetables that are actually fruits, such as tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, zucchini, we don't want a lot of leafy growth. We want the energy to go into the fruits. So you want a fertilizer where the second number is bigger than the first number, such as here. The second number is twice the phosphorus. There's more phosphorus than nitrogen in here, which is a good fertilizer for vegetables that are botanically fruits. Keep that in mind. If you would grow spinach or lettuce or a cold season vegetable, such as cabbage, then you would want a fertilizer where the first number is higher than the other numbers. And, you know, it doesn't need to be fish-based, it can be anything, right? Whether you like organic or synthetic, that's, you know, often a personal, personal preference. I uh, prefer organic fertilizers for many reasons. One of the reasons I prefer organic fertilizers is that it's much harder to accidentally over-fertilize with an organic fertilizer. Because a lot of organic fertilizers, and there's exceptions to every rule, uh, a lot of organic fertilizers, especially the powdered ones, are not immediately bioavailable. They need to be broken down by the soil bacteria first. So it means the plant is not immediately shocked with a high dose of nitrogen, which could burn the roots and kill your plant. Whereas with a synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, if you overdose it, you can kill a plant instantly with an overdose. With an organic fertilizer, it's hard to do that. You can. Uh, some organic fertilizers, such as Bat, bat droppings based fertilizers or even some uh, super high concentrated compost teas you can over fertilize if you, if you do it wrong but it's not as easy they, they generally have nutrients that are not immediately bioavailable so it's the bacteria that slowly make those available to the plant so it's harder to over fertilize another reason why I prefer organic fertilizers is because synthetic fertilizers and especially the synthetic nitrogen is a petroleum product. Mm. And you can all imagine, as petroleum is getting rarer and more expensive and more expensive, those fertilizers will become more and more expensive and increasingly unaffordable. And some of the uh, synthetic fertilizers, I shouldn't say synthetic because um, phosphates are mined in very few areas of the plant and we're about to run out of those soon. So if we keep using these kind of fertilizers, we're depleting the very limited stores that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're only gonna be able to do that for so long and it's gonna get more and more expensive as time goes on. Whereas if you use a fertilizer that's made from organic material, it's basically a recycled product. And I'm in a recycled product. So mm. that's my little spiel on fertilizing. Making your own uh, planting, container planting mix um, is that there's actually a little recipe in your handout how to make your own mix and there's literally dozens of recipes when you go online but they're all more or less along the lines of uh, half like 50% compost and the rest is usually um, 
either coir based, which is coconut fiber based, um, interspersed with either perlite or vermiculite. It's these like white little airy granules that hold air in the soil. And then they put in various additives, depending on how much you pay for the product. Um, they put in either fertilizer or no fertilizer. Some of them put in beneficial mycorrhizae, which makes it a little more expensive. Now, once you have your container prepared, selecting plants for containers. The biggest mistake most beginning gardeners make, I see, is people put too many plants in containers. So for a regular tomato plant, this would be a container that's like, you know, just a good size for a regular tomato plant. You could do it in a five gallon bucket, okay? It's just mm -hmm. a five gallon bucket is gonna need to be watered yeah. a lot more than this container already. So the, the bottom line is the less root space you have, the more fertilizer, the more water you're gonna have to add to keep that plant alive. So selecting plants, um, you know, any, any summer vegetable can be, can be grown in there. But now that I've told you that this, that a tomato needs about that much space, you can pretty much guess from that. If a tomato needs at least that much space, how many peppers do you think you could grow in there? How many pepper plants? Two. Yeah, two, maybe three if there are small growing, if there are midget peppers, right? Depending on, uh, for instance, ancho peppers or poblano, they're called poblano. Um, Poblanos get pretty big, so I would never grow more than two poblanos in there. But a lot of jalapeno peppers stay, the plants stay fairly small, so you could maybe fit three of those in there, right? Same with eggplants. Like the, some of the Asian eggplants are fairly small. The ping tung, you, you may be able to grow three in there, but I think two would be a better choice. Um, then with cucumbers, um, I would probably put no more than I want to say five cucumber plants in there. And then you have to train them, right? So most most plants will have to be trained. Most plants that are bigger than, higher than two feet will have to be trained. Meaning, uh, I don't see any training containers here, but here, uh, you can see over there, this is one way of training. One of my favorite ways of, of training in containers is simply construction panels formed into a cylindric shape. And I make the cylindric shape so that it fits exactly to the container that I put it in. So I will put this construction panel cylinder on top of it. And I make it usually about, so that the whole thing is no higher than six feet so I can still reach the top to harvest. And then the, the tomato can be grown inside that cylindric shape. So all you have to do is when one of the tomato branches comes out, you push it back into the cylinder. How about it has openings of six by six inches, so you can get your hand through to prune or harvest or whatever you want to do. If I feel that it needs extra protection, let's say a flock of migratory birds come through who I'm worried are going to eat my tomatoes, then I just put some extra bird netting around that cylinder of wire for as long as I need it. So how would you spin. plant zucchini? So zucchini, you could grow one zucchini in this container and that's easy. If you have enough space, you can simply let the zucchini overflow and grow around there. Or, um, you know, in the commercial zucchini production, they train it upward. And what is typically done, they would put two stakes in there. And then there is wires or, or uh, material bands between those two stakes. And then you can affix the zucchini to that little wall. You, you're basically creating a little wall in the middle and you're attaching your zucchini to that wall so that it can grow upward. But that, my friend Lisa did that last time with her zucchini and she said she's never gonna do it again. <coughs> it's so work intensive. Oh. Mm -hmm. That zucchini grows so fast. You literally have to attach a new part of the zucchini to that trellis every day. If you have a lot of space, but you don't wanna deal with it every day, just let the thing overflow and grow wherever it wants to. You know? uh, and you can still then, you know, guide that zucchini to grow in a certain direction, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can, you know, turn your thing a little and you can put up stakes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I put up stakes if I let it flow and push it behind the stake so it goes, so it stays away from the path, you know? So I still have a path where I can pull a hose through without hurting the zucchini. Selecting plants for containers. Herbs, obviously. Last time we talked about herbs. Herbs are the easiest plants to grow in containers 
because you know most of them are not fuzzy fuzzy about their growing conditions and the mediterranean herbs on top of it are all a bit drought tolerant of course i have to add to that every drought tolerant plant when grown in a container is much less drought tolerant keep that in mind because the reason why most plants are drought tolerant is because they form an extensive root system that is much bigger than what you see on top. Mm. If you squeeze their entire root system in a container, then what made them drought tolerant is no longer there. So, you know, even if it says on the, on the label drought tolerant, the moment you squeeze it in a small container, it's not really drought tolerant. It's still more drought tolerant than lettuce, obviously. <laughs> because those leaves don't evaporate water at the rate that a lettuce plant does, let's face it. But because it doesn't have such a big root system, it's, it's still not as drought tolerant as it is if you grow it in the ground. Container plant care, well, like we said, it needs fertilizer every six weeks at least, sometimes every four weeks. If it's a really fast growing vegetable, you may need to fertilize it every four weeks, such as the zucchini. Um, honestly, I fertilize my zucchini more often than that. I fertilize, I fertilize a little bit every week rather than give it a huge amount once a month because I use, after the initial period, I, I work fertilizer into the soil before planting, and after that I use liquid fertilizer, either that stuff or compost tea, and I use it at least once a week, in a fairly low concentration. You know, I don't dump huge amounts, but I, I use a, a low concentration more If often. you use, let's say, something like Osmo Coat, slow release, time release, then you would put these granules in there like every four to six weeks. And you can just put them on top of the soil and as you water that will release nutrients. The other care with container plants, obviously container plants need pruning more often than plants in the ground. I like a few containers close to the house where I can just run out when I make a salad and cut some parsley or whatever herb I want to put in my salad without having to march out to the other end of the garden. And yeah, they're a little bit high maintenance, but I walk by them so many times, so I'll dump a little water on them every time I walk by. I did only a container gardening class over at the other garden. We also made a wicking container. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what a wicking container is. If a wicking container is basically a container that has a reservoir at the bottom with a type of wick going into that, that delivers water to the plants above. And we made a really simple wicking container out of two five gallon buckets, one five gallon bucket into the other five gallon bucket. And so the, the bottom bucket contains the water reservoir and um, that five gallon bucket, it, it's basically enough for, let's say, a pepper plant or an eggplant. And because it's a wicking container with a water reservoir, you could go away for two days and that plant would survive. That's the advantage. They call them self-watering containers, which is a misnomer. They're not self-watering, you still have to water. Mm -hmm. But you can get away with watering every other day instead of every day because of that water reservoir. So. There is a ton of YouTube videos out how to make those. We want to thank Gabrielle for coming and teaching us about the what we can grow in Lake County and yeah. container gardening. And uh, at the end of this video, I will be posting the flyers for you to look at and also a link to the Caspio because we want to get your feedback. So it's just a, um, a quick survey. survey. Thank you. I was thinking in like, right. A quick survey if you can just fill that out. Thank for you me. for joining. Happy gardening. Happy gardening, yes. Happy container garden. <laughs> Thank you.